Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Bridging the Confidence Gap breakout session. Uh, my name is Keith McDonald. I'm the regional sales manager for Prime Point, and uh, we are uh, the special breakout session partner uh, this afternoon. So uh, thank you for having us. Um, we uh, really uh, appreciate uh, NJBIA and uh, thank them for having us. Um, we are a uh, payroll and HR technology company uh, located in Burlington County, New Jersey. Uh, we're a New Jersey company. Uh, we're very proud uh, to be the official partner of the New Jersey Devils and the official payroll uh, processor of the New York Giants. Uh, and uh, we uh, can handle uh, uh, payroll for companies with one to thousands of employees. If you uh, want more information, uh, you can come see me afterwards uh, right across the hallway there. Uh, a few housekeeping items. Um, I just want to remind you that the complete bios uh, for Jamie and the panelists can be found starting on page eight in the program, so we're not going to do uh, lengthy introductions. There will be time set aside for questions at the end of the panel discussion, but you're welcome to raise your hand at any point and wait for the moderator to call on you. Also, we are videotaping the session, so please wait for the microphone to be brought over to you so everyone in the room can hear your questions and be mindful of the camera as you move around the room. And uh, at this time, I want to introduce our moderator, uh, Jamie Barton. Jamie Barton is the Senior Director of Tech Diversity at Audible Inc. Jamie focuses on optimizing the tech organization's approach to hiring, developing, and motivating technical talent across the full human spectrum. Jamie is also a co-founder and board president of 28 Days Project, a nonprofit dedicated to providing feminine care products to women in need. So Jamie Barton. Thank you, Keith. Thank you all for coming. We're really excited to have this session with you on Bridging the Confidence Gap. We did it this morning, and we had a lot of fun with it and looking forward to sharing with this group here. Um, so to start out, I want to get you involved in giving us a sense of, of your experiences. So three questions for you. Um, have you ever left a meeting thinking, I should have said that? I should have said what was on my mind? Anyone? Right. So have you ever sat in a meeting and you've been next to someone who threw out a thought, a comment, an idea, and you said, you thought to yourself, I could have said that, and I probably should have said that, right, based on what you knew about the topic at hand. Um, and then thirdly, have you ever um, witnessed someone get a promotion or, and been happy for them, but at the same time thinking, I could have had that job, Th that should have been mine based on what I am able to do? Anyone? Right. So, I mean, you know, what happened there? Was it just a random set of circumstances or was it missed opportunity? I think today in this session we're going to talk about, you know, how confidence plays into that. And, you know, there are circumstances surrounding all of those things, but your ability to be confident in the, in the place that you are and of who you are is important in those success points. And so we would love as this group to share with you some insights and ideas on all of that and hopefully for you to take away. Um, so, you know, it isn't easy um, dealing with confidence. Um, even if you have it, there's moments where you probably have some doubt on, you know, where you're really at. And, you know, there are many resources out there. There's books. I listen to a lot of books because I work at Audible, so audiobook content is something I highly consume. And um, you can go get a mentor and, you know, you can talk it through with a peer. But, um, you know, the real life situations really do groom you a lot for learning and growing in this space. And a panel as well can be a way of getting some resources. And so I'm really um, pleased that we're able to be here today. So we're going to dig deep into a few topics just to give you a framework of this discussion. We're going to talk about confidence as a state of mind. What does it feel like when you're confident? How do you kind of get there? Um, what are the behaviors that you um, portray when you are confident? And how do people pick up on those behaviors? Um, what are some coping techniques when that confidence kind of seeps right out of your body? 
um, and what do you do there? And then as leaders, as leaders um, to your teams, as leaders to bigger and broader organizations, leaders in your family, as a role model, what do you do to help others be more confident or gain confidence or keep their confidence, whatever that might be? So those are, those are the topics that we'll cover off today as we talk to the panelists. So let me um, introduce the panelists to you. These are three amazing women. Um, to my immediate left, we have Ling Ling Ni, who is the Chief Compliance Officer and Assistant General Counsel at Panasonic Corporation of North America. Next to Ling Ling is Cindy Cullen, who is Managing Director of N Degrees, Inc. And I, I joked with her, she has a lot of credentials behind her name. And they are you know, amazing. And if you know what they are, you'll be further amazed. But um, Cindy can talk more about that in this um, talk. And then to my far left is Ms. Michelle Bajwa, who is co-founder of Domain Computer Services. So please welcome them. All right, so let's get started here. By the way, we will have 10 minutes remaining at the end for Q&A, and we will not hold you from seeing Bobby Brown at 145. So we'll get you through this session. Um, so confidence is a state of mind, right? It's, it's a feeling, um, whether you got it at birth or whether you grew into it, it's something that influences your thinking and behavior. Um, and as a leader, I would imagine confidence is a key ingredient you know, in a lot of your success. So I just want the audience excuse me, to get to know you a little bit better by understanding where your journey has been from, you know, your starting point, um, whether it was a high degree of confidence or a lower degree, and how you've gotten to where you are today or where you are today. So the example that I threw out was, you know, I have gone from, you know, sleepless nights before a big presentation to getting up in the morning and actually looking forward to giving a presentation, you know, so like that to me is a growth in confidence. And so we'd love to just kind of step through that with each of you to get the audience to know you a little bit better. Do you want to start us out, Ling Ling? Sure. Um, so confidence um, has been a constant struggle for me. It still is today. Um, I'm not a naturally confident person. Um, I have an older sister who is just a year ahead of me, and she was president of everything and captain of everything. Um, and I was sort of living in her shadow, and I was actually really comfortable in that, in that role. Um, but I very quickly realized once I started working um, that that's not really the profile of a person who's going to really be tremendously successful um, in, in, in the workplace. And so I think the key influences in kind of building you know, self-confidence for me is really making a distinction between self-confidence sort of generally and then confidence in the workplace. Um, because you don't really have to, you know, get to that perfect state where you feel wonderful about everything about yourself um, in order to be confident at work. There are certain behaviors that you can mirror and exude um, to make sure you're demonstrating confidence at work. But I think an analogy that works for me is that I initially, when I would walk into a room early in my career, um, into a conference room, you know, they have chairs along the wall and then they have chairs all around the table. And I would always sit against the wall because I didn't feel, you know, confident enough to sit at the table, someone might talk to me, you know, someone might ask me a question, um, and now it's changed when I walk into a room, I do sit at the table because I do feel I have value to add um, in, in, in the line of work that I do. And I'm sure you also try to encourage others who sit along the wall to sit at the table, yes, right? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Cindy? So I'm actually the youngest of, of seven children, and being, being the youngest, you have to be, uh, at least I found, I had to be very competitive because <laughs> otherwise, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times uh, uh, parents, they, uh, you know, as they have more and more children, they start to ignore the kids. And so you, so you, so you have to work hard to get a little attention. Um, and so uh, I guess I, I had a lot of, a lot of confidence um, um, because of that, you know, so it, it, it was the kind of the competitive spirit and I, I took that into uh, the, the, the work environment as well. So um, one of the key factors for me is I, I, I work in a technolo in technology uh, in cybersecurity, and so I have uh, uh, honed my technical skills, keep my technical skills up to date, have lots of certifications, lots of validation that yes, you know, you, you, you are a leader in the, in the industry and I've uh, joined associations and been leaders in the associations like uh, ISC squared and uh, OWASP. And so uh, I guess the way I uh, helped to build my 
uh, confidence is to, to have a high level of expertise and then also to have the credentials to validate that. Well, I'm an only child, so <laughs> I don't have any older brothers or sisters to look up to, so what I did was I had confidence role models. And uh, I would look at them and I would say, wow, they're so confident. They walk into a room and they just own it. You know, they have a light about them and anything they say, I am so following them because I have no confidence, right? So uh, I own an IT company, it's a um, managed service provider. And I started it when I was 19 years old in, with my now husband um, at, when I was a junior in college. So uh, long story short, within, it was right at that dot-com bubble. The, it was just about to explode. So we were very popular because we were young and, you know, we're hip and everyone wanted us to set up their dial-up modems and all that good stuff. <laughs> and so the way that we started our company was I thought I was going to be an attorney and uh, I was working as a legal secretary. My husband was working in internal IT and he went to my boss and said, I can hook you up with um, you know, AOL, you know, that sh modem thing, and three people can share it. This guy was just blown away. That's amazing. I can have three people connect and check their stocks for $24.95. It's going to be so good. So thus was born Domain Computer Services. So before I knew it, within three months of incorporating our, our company, I was pitching ten to $20,000 uh, projects to senior partners and law firms. And uh, I was a kid, I was 19, I'm a junior at Rutgers University. Um, here I am in a fancy steakhouse. I'm like, you know, I'm gonna date myself, but I was thinking of Julia Roberts and the fork and the knife and the flying escargot. I thought, oh my gosh, I am so gonna do this. Um, and they would, you know, they wanted, I, I didn't realize it, but these partners were trying to get to know us. They were trying to get to know us as business partners. And I was so shy and so reserved and so introverted. And I kept trying to evoke the confidence role models that I had, and it just never happened. I couldn't act like the one that had the bravado and the strong voice and was like, yes, I'm gonna do this and it's not gonna, nothing is gonna go wrong. So what happened was I ended up sort of misrepresenting myself as a business person. And it was a tough lesson to learn at a very young age. Um, 19, 20, 21, all tough, tough lessons. Uh, I slowly started falling into a rhythm of being very self-aware and realizing what my strengths and my weaknesses are. Um, as a naturally introverted person, like Ling Ling was saying, she is a naturally quiet person, I, I stopped putting so much pressure on myself to be the loudest, most dominant person in the room. And I set back, I kind of leaned back on my foundation of being an expert in my subject field. I uh, gave myself the self-assurance that as if I was prepared enough, enough, it didn't have to be perfection. If I was prepared enough, I could actually find a voice in that room. And it was, it's, it's an evolution. It continues to this day, st sitting at this table. Uh, but creating an authentic brand of confidence is really what got me to the place that I am today. Um, not trying to wear a mask wherever I go, uh, not trying to imitate the person in the room that seems like the strongest. I kind of get out of my head and just focus on that, on the problem at hand. So yeah. Yeah, I think that that authenticity is something that's really important because you you have to live with this, right? Mm -hmm. You have to live and breathe it every day, and it's got to be something that works for you. I think it's interesting of the varying responses here. I mean, Cindy, you have definitely dove into these, you know, your not just your credentials, but the experience that you've gotten through cybersecurity and all the technical skills that you have gotten so that you can walk into a room and really hold it with the room. And, you know, the others, similar, similar things where you were getting the technical skills and the knowledge and the information you needed to really sit at the table, but different approaches. And I think that that's just what makes us human. And when we go into a room, we're a bunch of human beings and we have different ways of handling all of this. And so that's important. Um, I, I gave the group some homework um, before this panel to listen to a book called The Confidence Code. It was written by Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman. And it's a book, it was written uh, in 2014 or something like that. And, you know, it talks about how, you know, 
why women tend to not always have the same level of confidence that men have and what's driving that and just a lot of conversations around that and I asked the panelists to take a listen to it because it provided some data points and insights that may be helpful in this conversation. Um, one of the things that they talk about in the book is the um, concept of failing fast um, as a boosting of confidence technique and the whole thing there is like you know women um, tend to focus on perfection and making sure that they've got everything kind of well aligned and completed and, and really done to a perfection point before they're willing to put it out there and say, look what I did and this is what you know represents me and, and now what can I do because of that? Whereas, you know, maybe men aren't always going to that same distance. And so, um, you know, the question for you is, what has been your experience with this around, you know, um, keeping moving and failing fast and not getting kind of um, down into the over analysis. What has been your experience? And also as leaders, how have you coached others through this problem? So when you see someone else going into this over analysis moment, how do you coach them to move forward and, um, and keep going to find their failure points, but then ultimately their success? Um, Michelle, do you want to start from your end? Sure, sure. Um, so one thing about perfectionists is that we never really act. We are, uh, you know, we're not going to do anything unless we're 100% sure all the risk has been mitigated, which is impossible. So generally, when I'm coaching any team member that has a tendency toward perfection, I tell them, you know what, you're good enough is probably 98% of the way. So calm down. You have a team around you to get you to that other 2%. So take that pressure off of yourself. Um, that's, that's something that really resonates with um, some of our team members. Um, in, in terms of failing fast, I'll tell a quick anecdote about my daughter who is 12 years old and in eighth grade. Um, she recently decided, she's also quiet, introverted. She's recently decided that she wanted to audition for The Lion King, which is um, you know, a musical. Um, as a <laughs> we're, not, we're not genetically gifted as singers, no way. My husband and I own an IT company for a reason. So um, she, auditioned. She, she auditioned on Wednesday, but this was after weeks of preparation. She's singing to us in the kitchen. She's singing to us in the car. Her voice sounded like an angel. I was so proud of her. And we just thought, my goodness, she's tapping into this energy and this soul that we've never seen before. So Wednesday after school, she, uh, she auditions and she comes home and I say, how'd it, how'd it go? It was the worst. And remember, she's a tween, so it's drama, drama, drama. And so it was the worst. I couldn't even speak when I got up there. You know what it is? You told me to smile. And the smiling, it made me fail. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so she got up on that stage and she said the fact that we had suggested she smile screwed up her words and she could only speak the words. She couldn't sing them. So here she is mortified. She's 12 years old. Her whole world's crashing around her, you know, down around her. All of her friends apparently did way better than she did. Uh, so I say to her, okay, listen, first of all, your knees were knocking, your face was shaking. I'm really, really proud that you got up on that stage. Just to get up there and even sing the first verse was success. So calm down. Okay, we, you sounded like an angel at home, but you know, sometimes things don't work out. Oh, well, I'm never, ever, ever gonna go out for anything ever again because, you know, all of that stage stuff, all the smiling, it's not for me. And I said, okay, fine. You can decide that right now, but give yourself some space, give yourself some room to change. So how about this? Tomorrow, why don't you go talk to your drama teacher and ask and just tell her, communicate with her. I was really, I had a lot of stage fright. You know, I got up there, I had practiced, and I had practiced, and uh, it just fell apart. And I just wanted to let you know that. I told her, be transparent. Ask for feedback, even in your weakest moment. Because what she says may surprise you. And it was so interesting. Ava's, um, that's the name of my daughter, Ava's uh, response was, well, I, I don't want her to think I'm greedy. I'm like, greedy? Why in the world would you think so? Why would you think they would... You know, you're greedy. Well, she's going to think that I'm going up to her and asking her what she thinks of me because I'm trying to hog her time and I'm just begging for a place on the play, blah, 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 blah. All that self-ruminating, all that self-doubt that we as women are very, very, very good at. And at 12 years old, she's already pretty solid at it, which made me sad. 
So I said to her, just do it, try. The next day she went up, she talked to the drama teacher. Guess what the drama teacher said? You know what, I could kind of tell you were nervous, but you weren't that bad. And you know what, here are some tips for improving your performance. And I think that you should continue to pursue your career as a thespian. Wow, how different. How different was that from Miss coming in through my front door, oh my God, life is over, you told me to smile, I'm never smiling again, all that stuff. Now she has ways to improve herself, she has an aspiration to go out for another play, even though she doesn't even know she's cast in this one, she's failing fast. She's actually going out there, taking, a, it's a measured risk, she did practice, but there was something she has to tweak, she has to learn how to sing in front of people, she'll get there. Iteration, adaptation, you don't have to be perfect on the first try and have the courage to get up and try again. So every time I think about something that terrifies me, I'm gonna be thinking about Ava hating, smiling <laughs> while she's singing, and it'll give me the courage to move forward. I think that's a great story, and it's something that probably a lot of us would have liked to learn when we were 12. You know, I think yeah. now, luckily because of mothers like you who can be role models and get that message to them, but you know, earlier on in our careers, if we had had some of those gift points, you know, those moments when someone gave us the feedback, that would have been a lot more helpful. You right, know, and to career. be open to it. A lot of us sometimes close ourselves to feedback, especially right. if you're emotionally hurt. You don't want to hear it, you don't want to change. And I tell Ava, and I tell myself, the ways that you can prove to people, and in business as well, how strong you are is at your absolute weakest point when you have to recover. That's when you can prove that the assets that you can bring to a situation. So, yeah. Great. Does anyone want to add on to that? Share some um, story? Just uh, a comment from the, f from the failing fast perspective. Mm -hmm. so, so sometimes you might not feel comfortable doing it in your work environment. It might, you might feel it's a little too risky. So, so there's always uh, the potential to get involved in other areas in your life. You know, so uh, I've, I've gotten involved in a couple of industry associations uh, or, or actually the other thing I did was I, I joined the school board. I was a duly elected public official in the Bridgewater Rare and Regional School District. And uh, so, so I guess what I'm suggesting is that you, 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 can, you can fail fast in other areas. So, so basically in less risky areas where you, know, you can, get, you can uh, work on maybe your presentation skills, on your organization skills, on your leadership skills without uh, jeopardizing your, pay, your paycheck. And so, th so there's a, you know, lots of different ways that you can get uh, get uh, leadership and you know the, the implement the failed fast model. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that if you look at people who have positions in the highest levels of leadership at an organization, um, they are in those roles and they are paid, you know, what they get because they have to make really critical decisions with imperfect knowledge, with incomplete data and oftentimes under tremendous pressure. So those are skills you're gonna have to develop um, if you want to kind of rise into those types of roles. And I do have someone on my team, you know, currently, who is exactly what you described, someone who does not want to make even the smallest decision without having every single piece of data available in the universe. Um, and the way I've dealt with that, and this sounds really mean, but it works so it's justified, <laughs> is I'll give them a really, really short deadline to do something mm -hmm. because I know it's gonna force them to make the best decision with the information they have or that they can gather in that two or three hour period rather than giving them the assignment and giving them a week you know, to think about it and run around in circles and look for more research and waste time. Um, but that does seem to work and so if you have someone on your team who, who seems to be very hesitant to make any decisions because they're you know, not confident that they don't have all the information, that they have all the information, you can do something like that. Um, hopefully it'll work out for you. But <laughs> But you can, you can do stuff like that. You just have to kind of know your employees, know how they operate, know their personalities to figure out what's the best way to encourage them to, to improve in that way. I, actually, I think just to build on that a little bit, the, the um, other thing is not to, once the decision has been made, don't look back. You know, don't, don't waste your time analyzing, oh, if I had done this, I had done that. You know, the, you made that decision, now live with it and, and, and move forward you know, so, so you don't uh, waste a lot of energy. Yeah, I love that suggestion of a shorter time frame. I think that if you're given too much time, it just can lead to, 
get a lot of extra work and maybe not the you know improved outcome. Um, kind of on top of all of that, um, one thing that I've noticed working in technology over the years is that I meet these people who in early in their career, mid-career, they're very much a subject matter expert or just very knowledgeable about a piece of something. And you put them in a meeting and they can talk and they can talk about it and feel really strong and confident about it. Then if they have to pivot to something where they don't have the knowledge, they get very quiet. They get like, they just don't carry that same kind of um, engagement in the meeting. And I'm just wondering for you as leaders, as you've grown in your career, how did you bridge that? How did you pull yourself out from being the highly competent, confident person to the sometimes not as competent, but still confident as a leader and as a person engaged in the conversation? Um, you know, maybe some examples. How have you leaned on other people to bridge that when you didn't have it? Um, can you share with us some stories? Ling Ling, do you have something that you want to start with? I think I'm having one of those moments right now. Oh, no. That's okay. <laughs> Cindy can pick I up. Can, That's I fine. Do it. <laughs> this is all fun. This is great. Well, Cindy, I, was, go I, was, I was just saying that uh, wh what I would say, though, is that you don't have to be an expert in everything. No one's expecting you to be that way. And I think sometimes you put too much pressure on yourself to always have the right answer. But if a question comes up in a meeting, you don't answer. You can say, I don't know the answer, but maybe so-and-so does. Or let me get back to you. I'll research it. I'll figure it out for you. But I think what's important especially in my role as an in-house counsel, is that you're demonstrating to the business that you have the resources and the ability to get them where they were trying to go. Um, and that's kind of the bottom line. Not that if I, they're not judging me on the fact that I can't answer their question right this second in this meeting. Yeah, and I, I guess I'd just build on that from the perspective of uh, in technology, a lot of times uh, other people in the room, they might know more about mm -hmm. the specific topic than, than you do. And so a lot of times the, if, if you're put on the spot, you can rely on the other people in the room, you know, to actually reach out to them. And like one of the speakers was saying, you know, people love to hear to hear themselves talk. They like to talk about themselves. And so a lot of times that will, uh, if, if you ask people to get in actively involved in the conversation, mm -hmm. it, it's a win for you and a win for them. Yeah, absolutely. I think that one of our roles as uh, confident and effective leaders is to remember that we're facil facilitators of discourse. So we are the ones who are supposed to make the environment comfortable for collaboration. So if th remember, that does not mean that we're the only person with the great ideas. Us, We as leaders do not ha need to have a monopoly on ideas. Um, but we have chosen teams because they have valuable knowledge. Um, if I see someone who's struggling in a meeting, um, one thing that I learned from the Confidence Code, actually was the Confidence Code or one of these other books, was um, the concept of amplification, which is, and I see some heads nodding, um, amplification um, was, I think, coined by women who were working in the Obama administration, which we know was a very, a very diverse and liberal administration. So there were a lot of women in meetings, and even though there were still a lot of women in the meetings, they felt like a lot of the more dominant person personalities were talking over them, and they just weren't able to get a word in edgewise. So what they did was they came up with the concept of amplification. So if I heard Cindy say something really, really smart, I wouldn't just snatch it for myself and actually say, okay, well, what Cindy just said, she said that we should do X, Y, and Z. Anyone have any ideas? Anyone want to build on that? That's what we do in our company. We actually amplify those, the ones that may not necessarily have the confidence to speak up, and we always give credit to the originator, and, there, and thus goes the collaboration of ideas. So amplification will actually make you seem as a more effective leader because you're listening. And you're, you, no one's saying that whoever spoke has to you know, be the one that makes up the whole process, but at least they got their voice in, and we're getting closer and closer to the right answer. Yeah, I think it's such a great gift that you can give to your employees to give them the opportunity to engage in a conversation amongst not just their peers, but senior people. And mm -hmm. that's a big growth opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's wonderful. So, um, so last week I was at two conferences actually in the Bay Area and I was just in awe of a lot of leaders that I was hearing their stories, their CEOs, and you know, just a lot of women who have really gone from you know individual contributor up to these leaders, and it's like that's such a big jump to make. And they talked about their journey, and you know, it started with 
feedback and, and grooming and someone who maybe took them under their wing and, and helped them understand some of these pitfalls. But eventually they got out on their own and they really are kind of hitting the right stride at this point and they, they kind of fell into their own lane, as you would say. They were just like, they're, they're going. And I'm just wondering for you, what does that seem like or feel like for you um, as a leader to be in that lane and to be driving and to be really more um, controlling that journey for you and then for others who are with you on the road? Well, so, so I'll address the kind of the, the mentor perspective. Uh -huh. so, so I guess, uh, I don't know, fortunate or unfortunate, uh, I, I haven't actually uh, had mentors or sponsors or, you know, whatever. To, uh, you know, it, they're, they're not easy to come by. The, I'm sorry, you said you have not? Or I have not. You have yeah, not. I have okay. not. Um, the, uh, I, I guess the... Uh, so, so it's not necessary that you find a mentor, and I think one of the one of the big things is to make sure that uh, you don't listen to the no's. You know, so there's a lot of people out there that say, "Oh, you can't do it," or "You're not ready," or "You're not prepared." Uh, you know, you, you have to have the confidence in your ability and your uh, uh, the skills to actually to to go for it. And the uh, a lot of times, you know, as a as a senior manager, what I've seen is that the, you know, a job will open up, and the and the women simply won't put their uh, their their resume in. They 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 look at the job description and and they see the two or three things they don't know, and so out of the ten, and so they say, oh, I can't do that job. The guys they look at the same thing and see the seven things they can do and say, oh, I can do this job, and even if there's only three things on the job description and seven that they don't know. They still say I can do that job, <laughs> uh, so it's it's very much the lean in mentality that, that mm -hmm. you you really have to have confidence in your ability to learn, in your ability to be quick on your feet, and to, to actually be successful. So so definitely you know, uh, even, and even when you're not really not really ready, I'd highly recommend you put your resume in. Mm -hmm. One, one of the, my managers uh, uh, told me that w you should always put your resume in even when you're unqualified so that the management understands that that's the trajectory you're interested mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. so, so then they become aware and that then they can help you uh, to you know, groom uh, for, for the, that position so they can give you more leadership opportunities and such. So, so definitely uh, lean in. Yeah. Cindy, uh, just a quick question. Do you mentor anyone right now, or have you done a lot of mentoring throughout your career? I, I guess it all depends upon how you uh, define mentoring. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so basically, I, I've been working with a bunch of uh, NJIT students and, uh, and uh, working with a few students to, to assist them in getting internships and that, that type of mentoring. That's great. Michelle? Uh, I guess one thing I would suggest is uh, learning how to embrace respectful conflict. Um, a lot, as a conflict adverse, adverse person, I would oftentimes not uh, voice my opinion because I didn't want anyone to challenge me. <laughs> so um, I've learned to embrace it by being vulnerable, but vulnerable in the way that um, criticizes the ideas that I came up with, maybe the process that I came up with, whatever the solution is, and take it away from the eye of it. Um, if someone says, you know, that wasn't, you know, I don't really agree with that. It doesn't mean I, you know, universally think you're a bad person and you shouldn't be in this room at all. Because sometimes we take things too personally. Um, so that concept of embracing respectful conflict, being vulnerable, but not so vulnerable that you're, go you're laying awake at night thinking, oh my goodness, I shouldn't have said that in this meeting and blah, 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 blah. Most of the times when people are giving you feedback in a meeting, it's just feedback on what you said. It's not feedback on your whole existence. So that's one thing that I really try to, um, to keep in mind. Um, don't ruminate, you know, don't have feelings of self-doubt. Take your, it's not all about you. Um, it is about you performing, but it's not really all about you and how you exist as a human being. It's really not that deep, right? So <laughs> that kind of gives, maintain, allows me to maintain some good perspective on life. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's sort of a, a a path that you follow when you're trying to, you know, be a successful person. Um, but I think it's important to remember, no matter how far along you are in that path, um, you will never know everything, and it's important to have humility 
I still learn a lot every day from one of my employees who's 23 and she's going to NYU part-time getting a business degree. I ask her, what did you learn today? Can I look at your textbook? <laughs> I mean, you just keep, keep learning, never think you know everything. Even if you know, your, your past career has given you a lot of success, you've made great decisions and you have confidence in your ability to do that, um, it doesn't mean that that's going to always be the case because the environment's changing and the world's changing. The culture changes at companies constantly, so just always be mindful of that. Yeah, I think we had a great opportunity to help the next generations who are coming along in the, in the business world to really um, work differently together than maybe how we've kind of stepped through some of this in the past 15, 20 years. Um, and also as, you know, as teams become more diverse and as we look to be more inclusive as leaders, there's things that need to be put more in the forefront as you manage people and as you lead them. And I think asking those questions and really caring about their path and sharing information that you have that can help them grow and learn. And like many of you said, sometimes that's a painful process, but I think that those growth points are going to be hugely valuable um, through time. And I think it's amazing the stories that you've been able to share with us on how you've done that. Um, I'd like to kind of talk about um, a topic around confidence cues. And when we were preparing for this panel, we thought that this one actually might have some legs to it. So we're going to give it a little bit of time here, which is, you know, um, you know, how do you convince others of your, um, your confidence? It's not just about how you look, although I was sharing with someone over lunch, um, yesterday I was at a, um, a summit for lesbians who tech, and Jane Lynch was there. I don't know if anyone knows who she is. Yeah. She's a comedian, and she's rather tall. And she said to everyone in the audience, from the age of 12, she really didn't have to do a lot to get people to listen to her, because she's tall. And she's like, I just kind of got the command of the room without even really asking for it. And of course, we're not all tall. We're not going to all have those physical characteristics that will give us that, um, that the, the confidence from others and everything. But um, just wondering from you, what are some cues that you may use in your work day, in your role, to give people a sense of who you think you are and who you are? Hmm. So I work with 97% men. And so uh, ex exuding a certain confidence is actually the opposite of what is sur I'm surrounded by, which is a lot of people just talking over each other and then who has the biggest ego and blah, blah, blah. So that sort of stuff um, I can't compete with because it doesn't feel authentic to me. Um, what feels authentic to me is being a facilitator, is listening, is empowering um, the, the creation of the best idea. So how do I do that in a room full of people who ha play by different rules, who communicate by different rules than I communicate with? I will actually sit down and talk to them and set found a foundation for interaction. These are, these are the limits. Don't interrupt. Be aware of other people in the room. Um, interruption is one of the singular, most frustrating things when you're trying to collaborate. You have one person saying something and then another person has an idea and they just jump all over you. And then the next thing you know, the whole conversation has been hijacked. So that, what I do is actually a little bit of the opposite. Um, I, in order to uh, signify some sort of confidence, I'll actually redirect conversation and give guidance to those who may be over talking, who may be overconfident. And then actually a lot of my day is spent coaching those on uh, those types of personalities on how to receive feedback and how to change and how change and transparency is not necessarily a sign of weakness so that it's it's a little bit upturned on its end but um in that way i that's how i find value and is by is by facilitating in that in that manner so and i i think uh, uh th there's some uh adage that says that you know first impressions are you know the the they last the longest or some, something of that nature so i do think it is important how you dress and how you look and so um when i started out as a, a security consultant one of the things was that you should always dress one step above who, whatever you think people in the room are going to dress so that you're you're commanding uh, physical presence by having you know a well being well dressed. If if everybody is wearing a suit and you show up in blue jeans, you know th that's not going to impress anybody. Um, and then uh, 
also, to, you know, things like a handshake. Um, you know, have a firm handshake. You know, the, the it's sometimes the little things that make a big difference from a from a uh, impression perspective. And then when and then when you talk, t uh, talk confidently. Talk, um, you know, t so that people can hear you. So if if you're sounding like a mouse in the corner, no, and you might have the most brilliant ideas, nobody's going to be listening. Partly because they can't hear you. And so uh, I think some those are just some of the the very basic concepts of how, of how to make a good impression and, and show confidence. Yeah, there's so much truth to what you say about there are certain sort of physical characteristics that tend to lend itself towards, um, you know, attention from others that uh, you, know, you just sometimes are just blessed with and sometimes you're not. But there are lots of other things that you can work on absolutely um, to, to compensate for things like that. Um, communication to me is number one, um, absolutely important that you are communicating clearly and with a sense of authority. Um, that's a step especially going to demonstrate confidence um, to those around you. Um, women in general, I'm completely generali generalizing, um, speak faster, um, the, 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 the tone is, is, is higher, um, and uh, those are things that a confident speaker sort of stays away from. So if you have to you know, consciously adjust the volume of your voice, the pitch of your voice, and the speed, you know, do that. Um, an exercise that I've, that I personally found to be really helpful for me is something I got from my Bible, which is the Harvard Business Review. Uh, <laughs> it's called channeling your inner expert. So everyone has something that they're really knowledgeable about, you know, not relating to work, just like a hobby or some sort of interest that they have, like movies or, or sports or something like that. Um, next time you're talking about those things with your friends or wherever, Pay attention to your mannerisms. Pay attention to the volume of your voice, the gestures that you're making, because when you are feeling you're an expert on a topic, it seems to come out in your body language. Um, so what you do is you do that, and then you kind of very consciously kind of memorize the way you act when you speak as, a, as an expert, and then just copy those things next time you're in a meeting talking about something that you don't really feel that much of an expert in. Um, and what it does, it kind of translates to your audience that you do feel confident, even though inside that you don't. You know, you, everyone's got something that they, but for me, like I'm really into skincare. I'm not a dermatologist, I'm not anything at a spa, but I know every like fruit acid and oil you can put on your face um, to make your skin smooth. And so when people ask me for recommendations about masks and all that, I can t talk about it, I get very excited about it. And you kind of pay attention, like I, I use my hands more, I'm more animated, I lean in, so I do all those things when I'm in a meeting talking about, you know, trade sanctions. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I think the other, th other thing that I, that, uh, especially from a writing and a speaking perspective, is to make sure that you're not speaking in a passive voice, to make sure that, that both in writing and in speaking that you're being authoritative, that, you know, essentially this is the way it is, not, well, I think, or, you know, so there's a lot of passivity in, in, in that, that women use, and we, we need to kind of put that by the wayside. Yeah, I think there are so many things that fall into that category of executive presence, and I know um, through some women at work, they all, they want that executive presence, and it's like, I don't know if there's a full-on recipe for it, it's like there are a lot of the things that we're talking about here, but then there is just like, you know, your knowledge base and your ability to communicate. There's, it's not just how you look, but how and what you're presenting of yourself and um, I think that role models are hugely important in trying to figure out what your executive presence could be and how what's effective in a room and I love all of these examples they're really good I think um, storytelling the ability to connect with people is also a really good one as far as getting people to kind of stay connected with what you're saying um, I think that's a pretty powerful tool mm -hmm. so um, I think we're gonna um, wrap up here and open it up for questions we have about 10 minutes and so we do have a microphone in the back that they'll bring forward if you just raise your hand. Uh, does anyone have the first question for us? Or comment, anything? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we do. Okay, we have about 15 minutes. Okay. This is on. Thanks, hi. Do you mind saying your name and what company you're from? Sure, Michaela Klein uh, from Audible. Uh, my question, so I think that, uh, you know, this is a really helpful conversation about confidence, but I think that, you know, on the, the, uh, on the flip side, 
I think that when women in particular show a lot of confidence in meetings, it sometimes comes across as overly assertive and then you end up getting um, criticisms that men might not necessarily get in the same kind of situation that you know, you're not a team player, you're not collaborative enough because you are, uh, you know, you're showing that you're an expert. A lot of the things that you're saying, I think sometimes uh, women sort of have to like toe a fine line between uh, being confident and, and being seen as uh, more collaborative. And so I'm curious about um, your experiences uh, in that and, and how, uh, you know, uh, well, first, do you, if you agree that that's a challenge, and, and then if you have experiences or advice about kind of how to handle that situation. Thanks. And just to throw in there, I think an, ir ir an ironic point on that whole thing is that women together are seen to be very collaborative, but put a woman in a room with other, well, non-women, um, then their collaboration or perception of collaboration goes down. So do you want to address that yeah, question? Yeah, uh, that's like my daily life every day, right? <laughs> oh, she's so chatty. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, isn't that why I'm here? So that's the point. This is why I'm here. Um, I'm seated at this table for a reason. You asked me to sit here. I'm not going to sit here and just be a note taker. I'm going to give you my opinion. And I'm okay admitting that. So if someone confronts me and says, you know what, you, you're shooting, maybe, maybe I am shooting down collaboration. Maybe I'm not taking um, you know, feedback. Um, I'm okay with hearing that too. Um, as long as we get into a conversation about it, I'm willing to change. Um, but just receiving that feedback, I've actually decided I really don't care, right? So I'm not gonna let it keep me up at night. Um, people have told, I, and men and women alike actually, so m women also have that expectation at times too where, oh, maybe she, you know, she's just kind of steamrolling over me and she's got too many details. Um, and I'm more than happy, and I, again, it takes a lot of confidence and self-assuredness to be able to re receive that feedback and actually want to listen to why you may have been perceived in that way. Um, but it, it doesn't hold me back anymore. I mean, yeah, obviously I, triple, I, I trip and I stumble and it'll be a speed bump, but it's not something that stops me from continuing on my path. Um, so I say shrug your shoulders, take the feedback, but keep moving on. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's similar. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I've actually uh, had anybody tell me, oh, you're not being collaborative. Uh, the, um, to, uh, I think a lot of times uh, women read, uh, try to read between the lines and might think that people are perceiving that. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that's one of the, the things that my, uh, my husband has coached me on is that if somebody hasn't explicitly told you to your face something, forget about it. Mm -hmm. If, if uh, you, you know, it's just your mind, you know, uh, churning and, and you should just uh, assume the best that, that everything went well and, and go forward and not, uh, not be, you know, trying to uh, um, overthink the situation. Just accept that, oh, you did good or you did bad, you know, from your own perce perception perspective, try to learn, learn from it and then and move on. And um, most people, uh, at least my experience is maybe, but I've been told I'm intimidating, I don't know. Um, uh, most people at least don't come and tell me to my face that, oh, you're not being collaborative. So I, I don't know, have you had people uh, say? Oh, maybe you're more approachable than me. <laughs> 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 here's, here's an add-on question to that. Should we apologize? When, when someone comes to you and makes that comment or, or approaches you, should you apologize? I, th I think it's situational. I mean, sometimes, sometimes you get a little heated. I mean, if you're talking to Ling Ling about skin care and say something with alpha hydroxies <laughs> is whatever, whatever, she may get passionate. But that's okay, because she's passionate about it. That's the thing. It's just about the skin care. It's not about Ling Ling as a person. So yeah, I mean, if I will apologize if I feel if I unintentionally hurt someone's feelings, absolutely, and I would expect the same of of someone else. Um, but if I'm gonna apologize because someone's just expecting me to kowtow to them, no, I'm not gonna do that. How about another question? Mm -hmm. opinions and uh, that 
vary from yours, and I'll be very knowledgeable on a subject. I will very succinctly make my point that's like, I feel great, you know, I'm like going at it, and then I stop. And I have a, tr I have a little bit of trouble because I give it about maybe what feels like a minute, but is more probably like two seconds, <laughs> to scan the room and say, okay, nobody's responding. So in my mind, then I'm like, okay, maybe I didn't make myself clear. So now what I do is I re-explain it, but now I'm like going in a circle. Yeah. Do you all, have you all ever experienced that? And if so, do you have any tricks that work for you to kind of slow your mind down? <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely do. I, uh, again, daily life right here. Um, I inject a question about what I just said. Did any, you know, did you agree with me on this point? And if they don't respond, then I inject humor because generally aggression, especially coming from a woman in a room full of men, doesn't turn out so well, so inject humor. Um, humor also lightens up the situation. That levity will help everyone maintain perspective. The men are probably huffing and puffing that you had a great idea anyway. So, you know, inject levity to the situation. But um, I would say you just have to keep kind of fighting. You gotta be gritty. Put your head down and just keep bringing up your point. <laughs> It's like, shh, yeah. <laughs> right, or perhaps you could ask for feedback. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think in those situations, it's really key to remember to be present. Um, when you go into a meeting, the, the, the purpose isn't for you to make your point, it's for the audience to understand your point. So if you're speaking to a, a group, big or small, and you're just getting sort of lifeless stares back at you, make a comment about that, saying, yeah. well, I'm just getting a lot of people staring at me. Does anyone want to ask me a question? Is there something I didn't make clear? Just yeah. make it an interactive experience and less about making a presentation and mm -hmm. making a point, because that takes the focus away from what the true purpose of that meeting is supposed to be. I think also um, this uh, related question came up in the morning session. Um, if you can find an ally or two um, to connect with prior to the meeting and explain to them what you're going to be talking about, if it's an opportunity like that, get them to understand what you're going to be saying, and then after you say it, they can be there to support you and to just even just to agree with what you're saying or to you know kind of extend it just a, that little bit could open up the conversation for the rest of the room. I mean. It's unfortunate that you have to use tools like that in some cases, but allyship is a really strong tool to have just in general in the office and for meetings and for other cases where you want your voice to be heard and maybe you're not, you know, there aren't as many of you in the room. But um, I think that that's very powerful. I definitely can relate to you in that example. And, and actually the other thing is that depending upon the type of meeting, sometimes you really need to contact every person that's going to be in the meeting beforehand, make sure that they're on board with the idea so that the meeting is really just a validation of, of, of the concept and not mm -hmm. kind of a new concept for anybody. You know, especially if you work in a, matrix, a matrixed environment, a lot of times that's a technique that, that needs to be leveraged. It, it's, a, it's a lot of work, though. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a lot of work, but a lot of people do it. Yeah. Coffees and beers after work or what that's for. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of that going on. So I think getting in that game and, and doing that, try it out and see if you find some success. I'm just the moderator, but that's my opinion on this thing. <laughs> um, okay, another question from the room. Hi, I'm Lorena, and I'm the owner of LWNH Business Solutions. So this might actually open it up to a whole nother conversation, and I'm probably going to run out of time on it. But right now, we're talking a lot about the confidence gap between women in the workplace. Um, and I know that obviously that's an issue because of the generation gap that we have going on, but as we have more millennials who are already more open to the equality and we're raising strong women, and I have a son and I have a daughter, so you know I'm, I'm raising one of each, but we have to be mindful, I think, and I'm not sure where that conversation lies in, is that maybe 30, 40, 50 years from now, are we gonna be having the same conversation where we've overpowered women back to the reversal where now the men are having these conversations of confidence in the workplace because they're afraid to voice something in fear of attacking or hurting or saying the wrong inappropriate thing. So I'm not sure if you guys are encountering that, but I know I've seen that with my 12-year-old son 
where he's afraid of saying something in a game situation because he's afraid to say like, oh, I'm being the bad guy or I'm being, you know, I'm not being fair to the girls on the team. So I, I don't know if that's something that you've seen yet or is it just because there's not enough of that millennial force in the workplace so, yet? So I, I have a couple of teen, well, one teenager and one early uh, 20s uh, uh, children and I have seen that in, in uh, among their some of their friends, but it, but it seems to be uh, one extreme or the other. So, so uh, especially when monitoring the boys, it seems that uh, either they're extremely confident and you know you, ca you can't get in a word edgewise they just uh, you know just a regular steamroller and then then on the other the other end of the spectrum they're they're very passive they don't they don't want to say much they're uh, very uh, I guess we used to call it shy you know they're they're reluctant to mm -hmm. they're, they're not as actively engaged and so I, I don't uh, I don't think that has anything to do with um, empowerment of women. I, th I think it's more, uh, you know, the culture, culture in general. It's uh, I, at least among the uh, th my my children's friends, it didn't seem to be related to to women. It seemed much more that it was, you know, they spent too much time playing on the um, on the social media and the games and not not interacting with people enough. So I, I guess I I would uh, would definitely not. Uh, want to blame uh, women's empowerment with uh, men losing power because because it, it's a it's a it's a joint empowerment if women are more empowered so so are men like like in my household my husband cooks at least 50 percent of the time maybe more and so <laughs> oh yeah and, and so it's a, it's a uh, it's it's a healthier environment when we have uh, everyone has the potential to be empowered yeah, and I actually emphasize, I have three kids, 12, uh, 10, and 7, and um, with them, I always champion empathy. I try to remind them, listen, everyone has their story. Uh, when you say something and they don't react to you in the way that you, ex you were expecting, it's not really about you. They had a whole day outside of you, so try to remember that, and that goes forward into the workplace as well where we have millennials who are coming in to the workforce and may not have a breadth of experience, especially in the corporate world, right? Um, you know, and they don't know how to deal and traverse certain situations. And I tell them, listen, you gotta get out of your head and you have to remember the person that you're talking to, they don't know your story. They just heard what you said and to them it may have been offensive. Woman, man, whatever. I think it's important to have a discourse and a dialogue before worrying so much about what you're gonna say that's gonna hurt people's feelings. If you have discourse and empathy, then I think you're at a pretty good starting point. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, apparently Bobby Brown's running late, so we have a little bit more time, so don't anyone get nervous. Um, any <laughs> other questions in the room? No other questions? Okay. Well, I really appreciate everyone's time in this panel. We don't want to keep you captive here, but um, I really want to thank our panelists. They put you know, a lot of work and took time out of their day to come here and share with you, and just let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and actually, before you all leave, two things. One is that Brian in the back, wave your hand, Brian, has um, Audible free listen cards, so if anyone is interested in um, a book such as The Confidence Code or other books related to that, please get a card from him. And then Keith from Prime Point, do you have any? Okay, no announcements there. All right, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much.